Good evening, everyone. I'm Connie Fales, a staff member of the William J. Clinton Foundation and manager of the Clinton Museum Store. As a friend for more than 20 years, our very special guest tonight, Marian Wright Edelman, I am honored to have been asked to welcome her and you to another wonderful evening as part of the Frank and Kula Compuris Distinguished Lecture Series. As many of you know, the Compuris family made a generous gift to endow a lecture series in honor of their mother, Kula Compuris, and in memory of their father, Frank. The Clinton Foundation is extremely, extremely grateful to the Compuris family, the Clinton School, AT&T Arkansas, and the Dickinson and McGeorge families. Marion Wright Edelman is a graduate of Spelman College and Yale Law School. Her career began in the mid-60s when, as the first African-American woman admitted to the Mississippi Bar, she directed the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund Office in Jackson, Mississippi. In 1968, she moved to Washington, D.C. as counsel for the Poor People's Campaign that Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. began organizing before his death. She founded the Washington Research Project, a public interest law firm, <clears throat> and the parent body of the Children's Defense Fund. For two years, she served as the director of the Center for Law and Education at Harvard University, and in 1973, began the Children's Defense Fund. Most introductions like this list all or most of the awards and honors the speaker has received. I couldn't possibly do that without running into tomorrow, so let me give you just a few. Marion has been awarded the Albert Schweitzer Humanitarian Prize, the Heinz Award, the MacArthur Foundation Prize Fellowship. In 2000, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award, and the Robert F. Kennedy Lifetime Achievement Award for her writings, which include eight books, including The Measure of Our Success, A Letter to My Children and Yours, which was the number one bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list. Her new book is The Sea is So Wide and My Boat is So Small, Charting a Course for the Next Generation. It will be available for you to purchase here tonight, if you haven't done so already. I see a lot of books out there. And Marion will be happy to sign and personalize it to you or a friend. Marion is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. <sighs> Are you feeling as much as an underachiever as I am tonight? <laughs> but here's the most important thing. The most important thing to know about Marion Wright Edelman is that her stunning resume is not the most important thing about her. She is a woman who literally devotes every day of her life to the hard work of making lives better for children, plagued by poverty, poor health, illiteracy, violence, adult hypocrisy, and injustice. As the Torah says, when you save a child, you save the world. And I can't help think but how different our planet would be if there were just a few more people like her. Please welcome Marianne Wright Edelman. Thank you. I love Connie Fails, and I'm very glad to have such a warm introduction. Thank you for the honor of delivering the Comforce Lecture this evening, and for the chance to be in this beautiful place. Um, I had not had a chance to come when it was opened, and it's just gorgeous. And Bill and Hillary Clinton, as you know, have been long, long friends and enormous influences in my life, and so I'm especially happy um, to be this, to be here tonight. And, and to meet your staff and to meet some of your Clinton Public Service students and um, two of whom were Spelman College graduates who were from Kenya, so it makes me feel very much at home. I am a mother of three wonderful sons and now I've had four beautiful grandchildren and they've radicalized me all over again. <laughs> And they have touched my deepest heart springs and evoked a renewed sense of responsibility. I look at our nation and world with heightened alertness for beauty and joy to share and for dangers that may threaten these dearest gifts and ask what kind of families, communities, nation, and world are we adults passing on to our children and grandchildren? What values are we instilling by our actions as parents, grandparents, faith leaders, educators, and political community and cultural leaders and citizens? What legacies are we bequeathing through the moral and economic choices we're making today? Are their nation and world safer or more dangerous? Will their standard of living and quality of life be better or worse than ours? 
Will our children and grandchildren be able to afford and get the quality of education needed to compete and contribute in an ever-demanding and rapidly changing, globalizing world? Will our nation be able to bridge and close our huge divides of race, income, and gender to foster respect and justice for all people? In this first decade of a new century, our nation and world, I believe, have veered alarmingly off track become less safe, less just, more precarious, and balkanized. The gap between rich and poor in the United States and the world are the highest ever recorded. A cloud of nuclear annihilation hangs over every child and human being. Global warming threatens Mother Earth, and before and after 9-11, we have come too slowly to recognize the oneness of our poorest world where disease, pollution, climate change, and terrorism know no borders and require collaborative solutions. And the militarism, the excessive materialism, the racism, and the poverty Dr. King warned could lead to our national and global destruction still run rampant. So this year I felt compelled, because it is a nation-defining and globe-defining election year, to write a series of letters to parents, to religious leaders, to community leaders, to citizens, um, to my grandchildren with my hopes and visions for their future, to young people um, who need to hear from adults what are the values we think are important. They can take them or leave them, but it is still our duty and responsibility to share them. I set out an agenda for our leaders, which I hope we can begin to focus on because I believe very deeply that while we're in the middle of this economic debacle, um, it is not as serious as what will hit us if we continue to fail to invest in our human capital and our children. And it's going to be <laughs> our failure to invest in all of our children is going to be our moral and economic Achilles heel that is going to topple us um, from leadership and competitiveness in the new century. And so I also want it because this is the 40th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign, and that is the grandparent of the Children's Defense Fund. And because Dr. King was such an important influence personally in my life, as well as to all of us, I wanted to write a letter to him, and that is the letter that I want to share with you this evening. And I hope that we will all begin to revisit and see and hear Dr. King. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel introduced him a week before his assassination at a rabbinical assembly in upstate New York and said that Martin Luther King, Jr. is a voice, a vision, and a way. And I call upon every Jew to hearken to his voice, to share his vision, to follow his way. The whole future of America will depend on the impact and influence of Dr. King. And I stood with thousands at the Morehouse Atlanta University Center campus as Dr. Benjamin E. Mays more, some, eulogized Dr. King, and he said that we have assembled here to give thanks to God that he gave to America at this moment in history, Martin Luther King, Jr., and said to him, Martin Luther, speak to America about war and peace, about social justice and racial discrimination, about its obligation to the poor, and about nonviolence as a way of perfecting social change in a world of brutality and war. And so I began this letter, which was, I guess, the core reason for writing this book, other than my concern about grandparents, but they're the same, as follows. Although you have been gone 40 days, you are 40 years, you are with me every day. We have made much but far from enough progress in overcoming the tenacious national demons of racism, poverty, materialism, and militarism you repeatedly warned could destroy America and all of God's creation. So I wanted to write you a letter on what we have done and still have to do to realize your and America's dream. Just as many Old and New Testament prophets in the Bible were rejected, scorned, and dishonored in their own land and their times, so were you by many when you walked among us. Now that you are dead, many Americans remember you warmly, but have sanitized and trivialized your message in life. They remember Dr. King, the great orator, but not Dr. King, the disturber of unjust peace. They applaud the Dr. King who opposed violence, but not the Dr. King who called for massive nonviolent demonstrations to end war and poverty in our national and world house. They applaud your great 1963 I Have a Dream speech 
but ignore the promissory note still bouncing at America's Bank of Justice, waiting to be cashed by millions of poor and minority citizens, and they forget your repeated nightmares, the deaths of four little girls in the Birmingham church and of three young civil rights workers in Mississippi's Freedom Summer and others across the South. The cries for black power begun during Meredith's march against fear that you and others completed after he was shot. The growing violence in urban ghettos in southern and northern cities, the horrible, relentless violations of your human rights by FBI Director Hoover. The storm of criticism that greeted your opposition to the Vietnam War, which you saw, was stealing the hopes and lives of the poor at home and in that poor country. The outbreak of violence in a Memphis march you led to support garbage workers and the resistance to your call for a poor people's campaign to end poverty, then afflicting 25.4 million Americans, including 11 million children. We now have 36.5 million poor Americans, including 13 million poor children, although our gross domestic product is three times larger than in 1968, and the gap between our rich and poor is higher than ever recorded. But you struggled on as the civil rights leadership splintered, as white Americans tired of black demands, and as the country became preoccupied with Vietnam. I marveled every night during the long Meredith march from Memphis to Jackson at your patient discussion with Stokely Carmichael and other SNCC leaders who wanted to exclude whites from the movement and push you to endorse all necessary means for change, including violence. You listened as they vented their justified frustrations about the slow pace of racial progress, and you tried to reason with them, repudiating their proposed black power slogan and strategies without repudiating them. You taught me and others of your followers how to parse out the good from the not so good, and to always seek common ground. And when you had no immediate solution, you gave others the courtesy of a respectful hearing. In the years between Montgomery and Memphis, you listened, learned, grew, and spoke the truth about what you discerned, and resisted those who sought to ghettoize your concern for social justice and peace. After your opposition to the Vietnam War provoked a firestorm of criticism by whites, blacks, friends, and foes, you correctly asserted that nothing in the commandments you believed in set any national boundaries around the neighbors you were called to love. Black people told you to be quiet, not anger President Johnson, and jeopardize his support of civil rights and anti-poverty efforts. White people told you to be quiet because you were not an expert on foreign policy. As if black leaders and citizens had no stake in a war tearing our nation apart and taking disproportionate numbers of black children's lives and forgetting that it was the experts that got us into this ill-fated war in the first place. Some contributors deserted you, as you called not only for an end to the Vietnam War, but for fair distribution of our country's vast resources between the rich and the poor. Why, they ask, were you pushing the nation to do more on the tail of the greatest civil rights strides ever in challenging a president who already had declared a war on poverty? You understood that our nation's ills went deeper and that our military budget of $80 billion and our Office of Economic Opportunity budget of less than $2 billion in 1968 to eliminate poverty was an unfair match. Thanks to the tireless leadership of Coretta King and others over many years, our nation celebrates an official federal holiday in your honor every January. You're the only non-president so honored and the only person of color in our history. And after numerous stops and starts, Plans to construct a memorial to you on our National Mall are moving closer to reality. It will be the first such memorial honoring not a president or war hero, but you, our citizen prophet of nonviolence and man of God who believe we could together build a beloved community. I am very proud that we Americans have come together to honor and to celebrate you. I would be even prouder and more sanguine about our future if we committed to following you. I caught a glimpse of your beloved community on the very beautiful morning of September 11, 2001, a day that changed America forever. It began gloriously for me in your hometown of Atlanta. 
I was attending the first Interfaith Alliance breakfast with several hundred Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Baha'i, Buddhist, Hindu, and political and community leaders of every color. We were affirming our joint responsibility to ensure a safe and fit nation and world for all of God's children. I was moved to tears as the Harmony Children's Choir, who looked like a little United Nation, sang the anthem of our civil rights movement, We Shall Overcome, as sweetly and convincingly as I had ever heard. But this taste of heaven on earth was shattered by hate and hell on earth, as your close colleague and friend, Andy Young, who became Atlanta's mayor and UN ambassador after you died, met me at the door with the news of the terrorist planes crashing into the World Trade Center in the Pentagon and of the unknown whereabouts of President Bush. I gasped aloud in horror at the world spinning out of control so suddenly and experienced for the first time on our American mainland the terrors of war up close, as many other nations already had experienced. Gone forever was our false sense of security and invulnerability that our military and economic might and political rhetoric had embedded in our collective psyches. My deepest initial fear was about the reaction of our leaders and the chance of a catastrophic Third World War with nuclear weapons. An irresistible urge to visit your grave site seized me. I wanted to tell you what had happened and to share the loving, hopeful vision of the morning darkened by the despair and death at the hands of faceless people whose names I did not know. Your prophetic warnings raced through my mind like the ticker tape at Rockefeller Center. Our choice is no longer between violence and nonviolence, but between nonviolence and non-existence. I wondered what God was trying to teach us through this unspeakable tragedy. Could it be a chance to bring us closer to our world neighbors, or would it push us further apart? Surely the extraordinary courage and generosity and sacrifice of so many trapped in or near the World Trade Center renewed our belief in human beings. One survivor of the Twin Towers attack said, if you had seen what it was like in that stairway, you'd be proud. There was no gender, no race, no religion. It was everyone unequivocally helping each other. It was another unforgettable glimpse of your beloved community that terrible day in the very epicenter of catastrophe. Imagine what the world could become if we realized and practiced what this survivor felt and what you repeatedly urged in less catastrophic times. I sat at your King Center gravesite for a long spell, grateful to be near you, and then walked slowly up Oregon, Auburn Avenue past Ebenezer, where you were ordained and preached with Daddy King, and then wandered over to the front of the former Southern Christian Leadership Conference office, where we had discussed launching a poor people's campaign on a warm August day in 1967 to make visible the intolerable poverty of white, black, brown, Asian, and Native American citizens denied a seat at America's table of plenty. We both knew that the civil rights, that civil rights without economic rights, did not add up to justice. As a civil rights lawyer in Mississippi, I knew my job was not finished when I won a school desegregation of public accommodations case in the next day. My plaintiffs were thrown off their plantations, lost their jobs, had no way to feed their children, were shot at, and their children harassed. I had to help them find a way to eat, a place to sleep, and protection for their children in hostile school environments if freedom was to be more than a hollow word. You knew that angry urban youth needed jobs, not sermons or scolding, and that hope with meat on its bones, jobs, and education was the only way to allay violence. As you greeted me alone in your very modest office, you appeared depressed, as you often were during the last two years of your life. I told you I'd just visited Robert Kennedy that morning at Hickory Hill at his home in Virginia, shared with him my deep frustration with the snail's pace in getting federal help to the hungry poor of the Mississippi Delta following his visit there in April 1967, when he had seen the empty cupboards of families with no income. When I told him I was stopping in Atlanta to see you on my way home to Jackson, he told me to tell you to bring the poor to Washington. And your face and eyes lit up when I conveyed his message. You called me an angel and made a commitment on the spot to the idea and told Coretta that evening. 
She wrote he came home that night radiating his old enthusiasm and said, this is really it, and I could see his excitement for the plan. He said we should get people from all the poverty areas, south and from the north, people who don't have jobs or resources. It must not be just black people, but all poor people. And he realized that such a program would be a great change for the movement, which had always focused on Negro rights. Such a powerful coalition, he believed, could really shake the established order and bring about the needed structural changes to provide a better life for the poor. Still in a somewhat surreal trance, I went across town to the chapel at Morehouse College, your alma mater, to read your words inscribed on your statute out front, and here's what she said. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny, and whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. The second quote, he said, the richer we have become materially, the poorer we have become morally and spiritually. We have learned to fly the air like birds and swim the sea like fish, but we have not learned the simple art of living together as brothers. You reminded us that nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon, a weapon unique in history with, which cuts without wounding and enables the man who wields it. It is a sword that heals. And your final message to us that day is if we are to have peace on earth, our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Our loyalties must transcend our race, tribe, class, and nation, and this means we must develop a world perspective. No individual can live alone. No nation can live alone. And as long as we try, the more we're going to have war in this world. Now the judgment of God is upon us, and we must either learn to live together as brothers, or we're all going to perish together as fools. I read your words aloud in my mind to the faceless terrorists and to our own leaders. I thought about your retelling the story of the poor, sick beggar Lazarus and the rich man Divies in your last Sunday sermon at the Washington Cathedral as you urged support for the Poor People's Campaign and warned America that like Divies, our wealth could be either our salvation or downfall. And I remembered that you called your mother right before your death from Memphis to give her your next Sunday sermon title, and it was why America may go to hell. I also remembered your unflinching call at the Riverside Church for a true revolution of values that will lay hands on the world order and say of war this way of settling differences is not just. This business of burning human beings with napalm, of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into the veins of people normally humane, of sending men home from dark and bloody battlefields, physically handicapped and psychologically deranged, cannot be reconciled with wisdom, justice, and love. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defenses than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And you said with we must, with positive action, seek to remove those conditions of poverty and security and injustice which are the fertile soil in which the seed of communism grows and develops. And in my mind, I substituted the word terrorism for communism. Your words strengthened my resolve to carry on your struggle to build the beloved community amid outer turmoil, and that noble, necessary, and hard but achievable vision beckons us today more than ever in a world teetering on the brink of nuclear suicide and spiritual insanity desperately hungering for moral leadership. Our leaders continue to talk about peace while spending trillions preparing for and waging war. Poverty, hunger, and sickness still ravish the bodies, minds, and spirits of millions of children and are a materially rich but morally stunted nation and world. Countless children have been deprived of childhood's innocence, trust, and hopefulness, wondering whether they will grow up in developing countries in our inner city war zones and suburban enclaves where a 17-year-old asked, how are we supposed to start our lives with death looking over our shoulders? And after 9-11, I was so struck by a 10-year-old from Connecticut who said, I'll never trust the sky again. The Bulletin of Atomic Sciences has moved its doomsday clock back and forth 
since 1968 when it was set at seven minutes before midnight. Today, it stands at five minutes to midnight as more nations possess nuclear weapons with a very scary possibility that they could fall into the hands of rogue nations and terrorists. Equally disturbing is the grim reality that the United States and Russia, despite the thaw in relationship, still maintain more than 10,000 nuclear warheads, poised to kill every person in our two countries in a few minutes. Rhetoric about producing more effective nuclear weapons makes not one sliver of sense. How could we stop the world spiraling out of control? If any nation dared unleash a nuclear weapon ever again to win any war for any reason, who were the maniacs who even consider putting a nuclear option on the table in today's world? Have they forgotten that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all they that dwell therein? Who made them God? Martin, how did we reach this insane place? Is there any way to thank, is this any way to thank our creator? For the life and earth lent us in trust for all generations to come. Is the cloud of potential destruction of human life the legacy we want to bequeath to our children and grandchildren? Has our scientific technology simply enabled us to go backward faster? How do we extricate our children and grandchildren from this nuclear prison? And as the world's leader in military expenditures and exports and nuclear capability, can America become a leader in nuclear disarmament rather than nuclear armament and pull us back from the edge of human extinction. National nuclear supremacy or winning a war with nuclear weapons means nothing in a non-existent world. I don't want my children or grandchildren growing up under this shadow of man's ultimate evil hand, nor do I want any child anywhere in our world being unable to grow up or growing up embittered because unused weapons of any kind or robbing them of food, health care, education, clean water, jobs, and the respect and protection owed them as children of God. I want to leave future generations a world of friends and not enemies. Thankfully, Vice President Gore has become our environmental Paul Revere, warning the world about the dangers of global warming and the degradation of our Earth. Although our nation constitutes 5% of the world's population, we consume more than a quarter of the world's energy, and our eyes are still opening too slowly to the folly of engaging in more wars to support our addictions to oil and consumption, and we're failing to adequately develop alternative and safer sources of energy. Sadly, your warnings about the dangers of excessive materialism and militarism are going largely unheeded. Since you died with the Vietnam War raging, we have engaged in 10 military actions, including the wars currently in Iraq and Afghanistan, and have spent more than $16 trillion in the military. Now, you warn not only about militarism, but about the dangers of poverty and greed, both obscenely evident today. The net worth of the world's 946 billionaires, most Americans, exceeds the combined gross domestic product of 138 countries with a combined population of nearly 2 billion people. How can we achieve a stable world when so few have so much and so many have so little? You said something was wrong with capitalism as it is practiced in the United States and recently released IRS data on America's 400 highest income taxpayers in 2005 confirmed just how right you are. The Wall Street Journal and the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities Analysis report that the income of these few skyrocketed between 1992 and 2005 to an average adjusted gross income of $214 million and combined income of almost $86 billion. But after capital gains tax cuts in 97 and 2003, they saw a drop in their taxes of $25 million per filer in 2005 or a total of $10 billion in tax reductions. This staggering one-year tax cut to just these 400 richest Americans could have provided more than 7 million uninsured children health coverage for a year, which Congress and President Bush said we could not afford. And I must say, I've been stunned since we begged all of this year for $70 billion to cover all 9 million uninsured children um, and prenatal care for all uncovered mothers. 
Um, they said we couldn't afford to do that, and yet look how quickly we could find $700 billion to bail out those um, who have brought us to the, to the precipice of, of, of economic breakdown. I think we've got to change our priorities. And yet incredibly, despite the growing gap, many of the richest and most powerful among us still don't seem to recognize that enough is enough as our economy hovers on the edge of recession and as millions of children have fallen into poverty, including extreme poverty, and lost health insurance. Now Hurricane Katrina ripped away the thin false veil of shared prosperity and revealed the pervasive poverty that suffered by hundreds of thousands of families in Louisiana and Mississippi. They were left behind as the water washed away the poorly constructed levees of New Orleans because they had no way out. And ill-prepared city, state, and federal governments responded with incredible incompetence and indifference, although many Americans poured their hearts out to help. Yet three years later, tens of thousands of Katrina's children and other survivors are still waiting for their government to rescue them from homelessness, unspeakable poverty, dysfunctional public schools and health and mental health systems, and post-traumatic stress disorders. And while the suffering of the poor persists and is growing, not only in Louisiana and Mississippi, but all across America with increasing food insecurity, credit card bankruptcies, and home and job losses. Many of our leaders want to extend the tax cuts for the top 1% and make them permanent and even falsely call their expiration a tax increase. Who in the world taught such reckless disregard for the common good? And why do we Americans tolerate public and private sector leaders who engage in such overreaching? If our nation's riches were shared more fairly among all Americans, and the rich simply got richer at a slower rate than a, through a tax structure and fewer government subsidies for powerful special interests and in individuals, and more tax reliefs and, subs and subsidies for low and moderate income families, millions of our children could escape poverty and get the basic necessities they need now to grow up to be healthy and educated adults, and I do hope that a critical mass of citizens and polit political leaders in both parties will stand up and demand that we reorder our priorities. We do not have a money problem in America still. We have a values and priorities problem. And we all have to say they need to be changed. We need more voices like yours calling for common and moral sense today. We need more leaders and citizens willing to struggle together to stem the out-of-control militarism and private sector materialism that still drives us. We need more leaders calling for an end to poverty and the downward mobility of large numbers of our children. And I'm confident that if you were here today, you would be ending poverty. You would say ending poverty is the top domestic and world concern facing us and would be calling for another poor people's campaign. Eradicating child poverty as a down payment on ending poverty for all will enable millions of children left behind to enter life on a more even playing field and to reach the first base of life in first grade ready to learn and rather than pronounce failures. If we invest in cost-effective health, quality education and parent supports for them, they will be able to make it to the next level of schooling to the second base in life, and if all schools would provide all of our children a quality education, and we could teach all of our children to read and to compute by fourth grade and eighth grade and twelfth grade, where a majority of all of our children still are unable to read at grade level. We cannot wait another minute to correct the massive failure of our currently largely segregated and still unequal public education system in which 85% of low-income public school eighth graders cannot read or do math at grade level. And since children spend only 17% of their time in school and 83% of their time out of school over the course of a year, investing in high-quality after-school and summer enrichment programs and utilizing summer feeding programs to stave off hunger will help more children get to third base. And young people need to see and believe that they can reach home plate if they stay in school and that a decent job and a chance to go to college are real. And the playing field that our children grow up 
must be cleared of the guns and drugs and cultural pollution that kill and lead so many astray. We must fill the ballpark's bleaches with positive adult cheerleaders, parents, teachers, neighbors, and religious community political and cultural leaders beckoning and cheering them on to success and comforting and sticking with them when they strike out or lose games along the way. And we need to make sure that there are skilled coaches and ample baseballs and bats to help them play the game of life well and when. Now in some hidden crevice of my mind, your assassination seemed almost inevitable. Nonetheless, when it happened April 4th, I, like millions of others, was devastated and completely overcome and with a profound sense of personal and collective loss. The violence you tried to prevent all of your life erupted in riots of rage and despair in inner cities all over America, including Washington, D.C. Robert Kennedy, campaigning for president in Indianapolis, hearing of your slaying, immediately went to speak to inner city black citizens, reminding them that a white man's gun had taken his brother's life, and that what we need in the United States is not violence, what we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence or lawlessness, but love and wisdom and compassion toward one another, Kennedy said, and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or black. So let us dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. You always call riots the language of the unheard. And now, our voice of conscience, your voice was silence. Eleven days later, Robert Kennedy spoke movingly again about the senseless menace of violence, saying no one, no matter where he lives or what he does, can be certain who will suffer from some senseless bloodshed. And yet it goes on and on and on in this country of ours. Two months later, on June 6th, my birthday, Robert Kennedy died from a bullet in Los Angeles after winning the California Democratic primary. Our country did not listen to either of you. Since your assassinations in 1968, more than 1.2 million men, women, and children have been killed by firearms, and another 750,000 have died violently by other means in our nation's relentless, undeclared civil war. This death toll of nearly 2 million human beings in our nation is nearly four times the number of American battle deaths reported in all of the wars of the 20th and 21st centuries. Most shamefully, since 1979, more than 104,000 American children and teens have been killed. This equals 4,177 classrooms of 25 children and is over twice the combined American battle casualty toll in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan as of April 5th, 2008. And another 500,000 children have been wounded. Our most recent annual child gun report reported 3,006 children dying from gunfire in 2005. That's eight a day, 58 a week, one every three hours. We have the equivalent of the Virginia Tech massacre every four days. We've made progress. It was 16 a day when we first began to issue these annual reports. It's now eight a day. What is it going to take for us to stand up and stop the killing of children? What is it going to take for us to stand up and challenge the culture of violence, where our children are sold violence and things repeatedly? I think it's time for us to reassess and see how we can reset our moral compass. The day after you died, I went out into the riot-torn streets of Washington and into the schools and neighborhoods scorched by riots to talk to children. I went to tell them not to be violent or to loot and raid so that they would not get arrested and ruin their futures. A young black boy about 12 or 13 looked me squarely in the eyes and said, Lady, what future? I ain't got no future. I ain't got nothing to lose. And I've spent the last four decades since you left us and will spend the rest of my life trying to prove his truth wrong in our powerful and wealthy nation. I had no idea how hard it would be. But this child saw and spoke the plain truth for himself and millions like him and our economically and militarily powerful 
but spiritually anemic society. I'm so worried the racial progress and the economic progress of the last half century that you and others sacrifice to achieve is imperiled by increasing incarceration, which is creating a new American apartheid. Our states are spending on average almost three times as much per prisoner as per public school pupil. And in some states, the increase in prison spending exceeds the increase in higher education spending. I can't think of a dumber investment policy. America has become the world's leading jailer with one in 100 of us behind bars and 7.2 million people in prison, jail, on parole, or on probation. And all of us must begin to look and see what is happening and not have us return to the past and look at the racial disparities and the poverty that drives and our over-reliance on punishment as a first rather than last resort. I think the imprisonment of America is an all-hands-on-deck crisis. If we are to reroute our children from the cradle-to-prison pipeline to healthy adulthood, we all must begin to work together to reweave the fabric of family and community and demand just public policies and practices focused on prevention and early intervention. We so miss your strong voice and are saddened that so many leaders of color don't take any better care of poor children and youth than white leaders who neglect them. And many of our cities and counties with the largest numbers of poor children being fed into the prison pipeline have mayors and supervisors of color in many of the school districts where poor children are being provided an abysmal education are being subjected to inappropriate zero tolerance school discipline policies. They have superintendents and school board members of color. We need servant leaders, servant leaders of all colors, not self-serving leaders if we're to build strong communities and save our children and futures. And let me just parenthetically interrupt this letter and just simply say I've just been amazed at what's been happening in our school systems with five, six, seven, eight-year-olds being expelled from school who clearly have mental health problems. And they're being expelled for behaviors that used to be handled in the principal's office and in the community. Um, but those mediating influences have gone. And so we actually see police officers being brought onto school grounds with handcuffs, three in, the, in, in a Florida town near Palm Beach handcuffing a six-year-old child, three police officers. I say, have we adults lost our common sense? Juvenile court judges in Ohio, where we did a study, the cradle to prison pipelines, had children are coming in at younger and younger ages, and they're so small you can't even see their faces over the table. The judges say, what, what, what could you possibly have done? Um, at such a young age, we have got to rethink our responsibilities as adults to young people and figure out how we can put them on a path that doesn't lead them to social ostracism and to social death. But there's some good news. There's hope. Amid all the peril that I have described to you, in this nation-defining election year, we have seen extraordinary changes that America's DNA on gender has been stretched by Hillary Rodham Clinton to a place that we never thought we could go. This impenetrable glass ceiling is no longer going to be there. And our glass ceiling on race has changed as we sit and contemplate the possibility of a first black president of the United States. And we have not seen our young people so politically engaged since 1968. And so that's a wonder to believe. We have far many greater numbers of black elected officials from 1,500 to 9,500 today. We have 43 members of the Black Caucus. We have sent some black astronauts to the moon, we have Supreme Court justices, we have Nobel laureates, we have blacks and Hispanics who are heading up Fortune 500 corporations. We have seen the growth of the black and Latino middle class, and we have seen much greater going on to higher education, and that is something to be very, very proud of. But we must pay attention to those that have not been able to walk through the doors of opportunity. And despite these significant strides, we have got to make sure that we reach back, build the bridges between the black middle class and the black poor, and between all of us who have enough and those who don't have enough, to see how we can begin to make America move ahead again and stop the downward mobilities of our children. I think while we have two Americas in many ways still, we also have two black Americans, and I worry so much 
that about a third, the data shows us, of black children may not do as well as their parents' generation. And when I think back at the sacrifice that so many made during the 60s, just so their children get a better education, to look at what we went through in Little Rock and the transformation that has happened, to look at what happened with little Ruby Bidget in New Orleans, and then to see what is going on in New Orleans, and to see one of my heroines, May Bertha Carter, who we were able I was privileged to serve as a lawyer who challenged freedom of choice and Senator Eastland's Sunflower County sent her seven younger children because she didn't want them to have the life that she and her husband had had. They all went on to Ole Miss and, and Mississippi State and became professionals. But then to hear two years ago, which is why we're now focusing on the cradle prison pipeline, that her grandson, Lorenzo, is now in parchment prison. We can't go back there. But we know how to transform these things. The cradle prison pipeline, the continuing poverty, are not acts of God. They are our choices, and we can, as citizens and as leaders, change those choices. We have seen miracles happen over the last 40 years. Who would have thought that American apartheid could end thanks to the witness of a brave group of young of lawyers, and I'm just so proud to see Wally Branton's son here, and Wally Branton was one of the great lawyers of the civil rights movement, and to see what a, a small group of young people could do, and children were the frontline soldiers of the civil rights movement, and we need to empower children today to begin to understand their history and to understand how they can change that history. Who would have thought that we would see legal apartheid fall in South Africa and see Nelson Mandela walk out of jail ramrod straight after 27 years and handing, extending his hand of reconciliation to his jailers? Who would have thought we'd see the Soviet Union, the Soviet Empire crumble? Um, who would have thought that we'd see the Berlin Wall fall? But it is time now to have a new movement that is going to really address the social and economic underpinnings that all of our people need in order to realize their potential. We must tackle poverty. We must tackle the lack of health care. We must tackle the illiteracy that imprisons so many people in misery and that feeds, I think, the instability of our world. But we can do that, and we must step up to the plate. We need more successful role models because segregation drained off or desegregation often robbed our children and youth of a sense of the positive and a positive vision of the future. And all of us, I think, in the black community particularly, must reclaim our traditional values of family and community and self-help and share with all of our children and all of America the spiritual legacy of the black struggle for justice and catalyze and mount a powerful crusade to save all of our children joining with our Latino brothers and Native American brothers and Asian brothers and sisters and all people who share your goals of a beloved community. We must train a critical mass of young servant leaders as we were trained in the 60s and arm them with nonviolence and the skills needed to build the 21st century movement in much more complex terrain and galvanize the dormant but powerful voices of women of all races. And the faith community must stand up and remember the God they profess to serve and stop being cultural puppets. And we must continue to struggle. <laughs> we must all continue to struggle against the resegregation of American society by race or income or gender or incarceration that undermine the realization of a United Nation blessed with a rich diversity of people. Integration, as you believe, does not mean losing who you are. It is sharing who you are, forging mutually respectful and equal relationships with others. You blessed America with your rich faith and spiritual traditions and prophetic preaching. You gave us your deep and abiding love and lifelong commitment to nonviolence. You shared your moral clarity and courageous truth-telling. You left us your unrelenting commitment to justice for the poor and every one of God's children. And you showed us the way through your example and call for massive nonviolent action in the service of justice and peace. And you gave us your life, and we thank you, and we will carry on. And what can we do to carry on? One is we can all get out and vote and make sure that we know the choices that we have. We have two senators, who, one of whom has um, 
an 87% voting record, and we have one with an 85% voting record, but we also have another with a 28% voting record. Go look at our, w, our website and look and see how they have voted for children, and then vote for those who vote for children. And make sure you send us people from Arkansas. Your delegation is 11th best in the country, and I thank you. We got one who's on the margins, and you ought to look at that. <laughs> and make sure you send us people who are not going to make our job harder. I hope you will speak to all of our leaders about investing in our children first. Next year, we need to talk about, and we, we've talked about health coverage for every American. We want to have health coverage for every American. But we've been debating that for about six decades, folks. And children can't wait. If next year we do not get health care for everybody, we've got to get every child and every pregnant mother. They have only one childhood. We have got to break the cycle of dependency. We have got to see that every child gets health care. And I hope you'll just give that message that either within the context of universal health insurance or without universal health insurance, every child and every pregnant mother is going to be born with the most level playing field that we can achieve. The CHIP bill is coming up in March. We don't want the CHIP bill because it leaves five million children out, doesn't reform the system, and makes the bureaucracy still continue. Let's do it right. Seventy billion dollars can help us do it right for five years, and I don't want to hear them tell me they can't find the money. They can find it the exact same place they found the money that we have. we got to be going a cradle to prison pipeline summit here in Little Rock on April 30th and May 1st. We had a wonderful meeting today to start the planning process. Let's look at that cradle to prison pipeline in Arkansas and let's begin to reorder our spending priorities and put it into prevention, put it into early childhood, put it into schools and keep it out of prisons. I'm getting older and I want to be having every child support my Social Security and my Medicare, and I do not want to be supporting them in prison. And so even if we don't like these other people's children, we should go ahead and invest in them because I'd rather spend 10000 up front than to spend 100000 to keep them in jail year by year by year. So it is in our self-interest to speak up. And we've got a wonderful thing that's going on with freedom schools around the country. And there are hundreds, like 1,200 young college students, mostly black and Latino, get trained for a week at Haley Farm, which is our leadership center. And they go out and they do freedom schools for about 9,000 children each summer. Children don't need Michael Jordan. They need somebody who grew up three blocks away from them, went through the same barriers, went to college, coming back to give back. And I'm so proud of these young people um, who are teaching children they can make a difference. We talk about empowered children. We talk about children who learn how to serve. Children live up to our expectations. They are now learning that they can be citizens. They are not citizens in waiting. They are citizens right now. And it is a great pleasure to see hundreds of children, four or five hundred children, walking into a senator's office back home asking why they voted against my health care or why are you not doing something about guns? It's really an extraordinary thing. And they're learning to love to read, and they're actually beginning to read in our first national... And if you spend time and it's child-centric and they know you love them, and I'm trying to get everybody to go to teaching, I kept all three of my sons out of law school, and they are all trying to invest in education, but teaching and education is a front line of the new civil rights movement that we've got to get. And we really need to talk to everybody and reorder the status of teaching and education in our society and the value with which we, we, we look at them. And, um, and we also need to reward teachers and hold them accountable for results. You cannot have 80% of your minority children not reading, um, or 85 percent of your low-income children not reading at grade level. Got to hold them accountable, folk. And I say to them, we should reward you, but you have got to make sure that you perform. And most importantly, if you don't love children and you don't respect children, please go do something else. Because that confidence building is the most important thing that we can give them. But we know how to educate children. We do it for some. We now got to do it for everybody. We know what works. We know how to give good health care. Let's go out and build a movement in the spiritual will to make it happen. Let me just end with a very brief prayer. God, we have pushed so many of our children into the tumultuous sea of life in small and leaky boats without survival gear and compass. Forgive us and help them to forgive us. Help us now to commit each of us to give all of our children the anchors of faith and love, the rudders of purpose and hope, 
the sails of health and education, and the paddles of family and community, and keep them safe, to keep them safe and strong when life's sea gets worse and gets rough. If we don't stand up for our children, we don't stand for anything. And we're not going to stand strong in the new century. And I hope that we can, armed with nonviolence, build a nonviolence movement for the 21st century and see that every child has hope and knows that they live in a country that loves and respects and is going to treat them all equally. Thank you so much. My name is Eric Wilson. I'm the Director of Development and Assistant to the Dean at the Clinton School of Public Service. And uh, she wants to take a few questions. Uh, we have a little bit of time before we move on to the book signing. So uh, two requests that uh, first, if you please raise your hand so I can recognize you. And then second, we have volunteers with microphones. If you'd wait on them to give you one so everybody can hear your question, everybody can participate. Well, we'll start first in the Clinton School student section. It's appropriate. Good evening. My name is Chad Williamson. I'm a student here, class of 2010. Oh, yeah. um, I've been a private school teacher before coming to the Clinton School. And uh, in Charles Barkley's book, Who's Afraid of the Large Black Man, he talks about how private schools uh, were one of the worst things to happen to America. How, how can you describe the disconnect between a $1 billion endowment at, at Phillips Exeter to a struggling high school in the Arkansas Delta, Mississippi Delta? Well, I don't know how I could describe it. There is a disconnect. We've got to figure out. You know, people can have choices, but I think that what I do believe very fundamentally is that there's got to be an absolute floor to what we provide for every child. I would not close down Phillips Exeter. I would try to make sure that we got more access to as many children who wouldn't have that access as possible through scholarships and through good preparation and through um, open access into scholarships. But at the same time, you know, private schools are not going to be the answer to the millions of children who depend on public schools. 95% of our children attend public schools. And while I am for public school choice and for charters and performance schools, I'm so proud of my oldest son who is in charge of 80 charter schools in the Chicago public school system and performance and contract schools. We've got to figure out how to make all the schools in Chicago and all the children have um, the, the basic competence to our public school teachers. And we need very radical new reform. That's why we've got to entice more people to go into teaching. Um, we've got to award those who merit pay that do well and who perform. We need to have um, clear accountability standards, and I hope we can have a more robust debate when No Child Left Behind comes up. We need to test, but we don't need to rely solely on test and we need to have multiple assessments and we need to have we need to address teacher quality and we need to and, and class size and, and, and but we also need to engage the community in, in, in creating an ethic of learning and one of the school systems that I cite because there are lots of wonderful schools, public schools as well as private schools in the country, but a lot of wonderful public schools, but there are not a lot of wonderful whole public school systems. And we really have got to bring about systemic change. And Wake County, North Carolina, which is Raleigh, I think is one that I do cite. It's one of about the 40th largest school system. But you saw what good leadership, clear goals, clear collaboration with all the community entities, with business being behind building a productive workforce. And they have raised the floor where 80% of their children are, are really at grade level now. And I think that they're going to make their 90% goal. But you can do it with strong leadership. And so I think that um, we've got to make sure that we invest adequately in education. And that's why we've got to reorder our budget priorities. And so you know, we talked about. Um, President Bush promised he was going to be the education president, and then he invested, you know, I can't tell you how many more 
amounts of money into war and into the tax cuts for the top 1%. We could have had a revolution in our public school education had the tax cuts for the 1% gone into investing in our children. So we citizens just have to get busy and talk about both recruiting better personnel but rewarding them and making sure that there's a minimal level of competency in every one of our children. But you know, schooling and achievement doesn't just begin when kids come into school. We've got to have a high quality early childhood system, health issues, Health coverage is an education issue. If a child can't see and can't hear the teacher, they're not going to learn. And so we've got to deal with the whole child because children don't come in pieces. And we've got to have the whole community false in ethic of achievement. In my house, when I was growing up in a segregated town where there was bad schooling, we always had books in our house. We didn't have a whole lot of money, but before we got a second pair of shoes, we would always have extra books. And the churches emphasized reading, and we've got freedom schools now going on in churches. And when you reach out and tell kids that there's, there's a new vision, you know, they will respond to it. So the whole community has to chip in and make sure that kids understand that we're not going to let them fail and put in the place the supports that we need. But it has to be in significant part through our public school system. Years ago, Justice Thurgood Marshall wrote a dissenting opinion where he challenged the notion that somehow there was something fair about apportioning education dollars based upon the wealth of the property in school districts because he said that it basically created a systemic disparity right. that doomed children in rural districts and poorer districts to a, to a less fair and uneducated system. How can we change that mindset that basically says, if I move to the right place, I can guarantee that I will demonstrate that my child will be smarter just because of his or her address? We have got to address the income inequalities in every aspect of American life that are still there and the racial inequalities that flow from that because those who are black and Hispanic have had a history of being extra poor and so the, 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 the inequities accumulate from before birth and they still come into an unlevel playing field and we've got to deal with the systems that continually perpetuate that, including the reliance of public education spending based on property taxes, I'm um, in zip codes, and there's, you know, been challenges. But we've got to, we've got to make a commitment in this country um, to what we say we believe. And if we believe that everybody is 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 sacred, um, our Declaration of Independence says that you know everybody's entitled to certain inalienable rights. I mean, if we who come from a Judeo-Christian tradition or who respect all great faiths to say that every human being is sacred, and I believe that, that every child is sacred, then I don't know how we can continue to make this distinction between our children and other people's children. And we're going to have to come to grips with who we are as a people and what we believe um, as a people and then begin to honor that and how we respect and invest in all of our children. And if we can't do it because it's what we believe as Christians or Jews or Muslims or because of the dictates of our faith, and if we can't do it because we really don't have the strength or the courage or mean what our creed says, then we better do it out of self-interest because it is going to be to our advantage again to invest $5,000 in a quality Head Start program, an early Head Start program, or in health care to keep them all out of their emergency rooms or to keep them from becoming dependent than to spend 100000 or 200000 later on. So we should just appeal to their common sense self-interest. I mean, how many people can you lock up and how many people can you support as you lock up? So I just think that we have got to keep raising a ruckus and pointing out the inequalities and the disparities and systematically challenging them until we change. And I just think that in the next 10 years, our that mothers and grandmothers, we'll let you men help us out. But I just think that we've got to raise a ruckus about the priorities of our nation and, and claim all of our children and make sure that we're making sure that the children that our children have to walk the streets with and have to grow up with are going to be children that are not going to be threats to them and to any of us. So I think our job is to change it, but we've got a lot of things and we just have to systematically create the new strategies and keep raising the questions and, and one day if we hang at it, I'm, I'm convinced we're going to have our movement, we've got to, we can't go on this way um, and be who we say we're going to be. So it's movement time and we'll have to find our own ways to keep challenging these and do multiple strategies and just never give up because again I point back to where we have come from 
and we have come from the impossible, and we're about to hopefully achieve the impossible again in this country, so that hopefully every young man and woman will believe the American dream really is alive and that they can, if they work hard, and even if they come from a single mother who was on food stamps, but if they can work hard and, and get an education, and come back and try to give back that they can actually reach the highest tiers of leadership. What a good day that will be for America, and let's hope that we're able to transcend race for the first time in our history in the broadest way um, and release ourselves from this noose which has held us all back. And what a symbol is going to be if we're able to achieve it in a world that is two-thirds non-white and two-thirds poor to see what America can achieve. I think it will bring a new vibrancy um, to us, and I hope that the best comes and if we do get new leadership and we as citizens support that new leadership and bring about new priorities, I think that hopefully we'll see a lot of other things change. But thank you for being so wonderful tonight.